thank you everyone for, for joining this morning. So we, we won't be talking about peptides today uh, here. Uh, I mean, my colleague later today will be happy to discuss about peptide projects. We're here. We'll focus on oligonucleotides and how do we see the market, how do we see the challenges, and how does polypeptide can tap into its peptide heritage and apply that to oligonucleotides. So that's what we will be discussing together in the next uh, few minutes. So back in 2020, we've been looking into oligonucleotide. As you may know, we've been manufacturing peptides for more than 70 years. And we've been taking an interest into oligonucleotides in 2020, approximately. So in 2020, we looked at the market. And that's what I'm going to share with you here, all the, the peptide market, the oligonucleotide market as we see it. And in 2020, we looked at the pipelines. So we've looked in, in various databases. And the numbers we've got back in time was that we did observe 186 clinical programs that have been, had been initiated. 63 of them still active back in time in 2020, 92 completed, and 31 withdrawn or terminated. So most of them, as we've seen, were in America. So in the US or, or in Canada for 140 of them. Quite a lot of them in Europe as well, 63 and a significant number in, in the Asian market, so China, Korea, and Japan as well. So that, that's an interesting start. So we've been continuing to look into more details about those clinical programs. And among those 63 actives, what we found out was that 29 of them were in phase one, 27 phase two, and seven in late stage phase three. So among them, 16 in the US for phase one, 18 in the US for phase two, and four in the US for phase three. So quite an active clinical pipeline in terms of oligonucleotides. So we, we've taken another step to look at commercial oligos. And so those are numbers from 2020, and, and as, as you know certainly better now, uh, two more have been popping up in the recent two years. But the first one, to the best of all knowledge, have been uh, commercialized in 2016 with, uh, for instance, Jazz, Pharma, Sarepta, and Biogen, mostly on niche uh, indications such as Duchenne or uh, spinal uh, muscular atrophy. So they were quickly followed by plenty of others in 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. So um, the same actors, so Dinovax, Axia, Alnilam, and, and uh, some others. So we've seen that as compared to our you know, peptide experience, that's quite a lot. That's quite a lot of commercial oligos start popping up all at the same time. So it looks like an exciting field for us. So we've been taking a look at the growth of the market. And the number we could come up with in 2022 was a therapeutic market share of 4.5 billion USD. And it was, according to all source, expecting to, expected to grow by approximately 18% per year to reach more than double its size, so about 10 million USD by 2027. So please note that this not includes any COVID vaccine, mRNA vaccines that are, of course, uh, influencing that quite significantly. So that's grown. Okay, that, that's another good indication for us. So how does that look in terms of early pipeline? So we've looked at that in also more details, and we found out that we could observe approximately 860 oligos in the pipeline, a whole lot of them in preclinical, so preclinical studies, talk studies, more than three th uh, third of that. And as we've just discussed, quite a bunch of them in phase one, phase two, quite a few in phase three and, and the commercial, the third in we've just discussed in commercial. So that's a huge pipeline to, to supply. Indications are very varied, uh, most of them in cancer. So it can be you know, uh, lung cancer, uh, breast cancer, liver cancer, and others. But also neurology, viral infection, liver diseases, and other. So quite far away from what we are experiencing in the peptide field, where it's mostly driven by diabetes and obesity, right? So very interesting, very interesting. And we've been discussing then with various actors, with you know, uh, partners, customers, competitors. And we've noted a few challenges in the oligonucleotide synthesis field. And those challenges were 
that the demand for outpaced capacity. It was, according to all sources, also fairly difficult to find expertise in all Uniqlo and manufacturing around. And the current technology that was used uses a lot of solvent and produces a lot of waste. So the costs of amidites are still pretty high. And very importantly, a few CDMOs had commercial experience, and that's, of course, related to the first approvals in 2016. So as, as well, as the title says, of course, we've taken the shot and we've decided in 2021 to, to go for it. So it's not really the first time we work with oligonucleotides. We've been working on a number of programs with conjugates, peptides and oligoconjugates and various similar molecules. But we've decided in 2021 to go for a dedicated plant. So we've started that in Torrance in the United States where we now have R&D and GMP manufacturing facilities up and running. Now a dedicated team, and we're working on those programs already. So we're building at the moment a portfolio of early stage projects. So we have a first building that is dedicated to oligos, with two small scale and one medium scale line, and we're currently expanding that. So we're looking at a second building, for instance, where we will increase that significantly and look at multi-kilogram manufacturing in the very, very near future. So how does that translate with our team and our different sites? So as, as some of you might be familiar with us, uh, we, we have six manufacturing sites globally. So we have three in Europe. Three in Europe in, in Malmö, Sweden, braine la Belgium, that's where I have my office, and in Strasbourg in France. So those three sites are designed and focused on peptide manufacturing from very small scale to very large scale. We've decided to use Torrens, mainly because the oligonucleotide uh, activities were focused in the US and in Canada, where we've been playing around with oligos peptide conjugates in the past as well. And so that's where we've designed uh, uh, our new uh, oligo-specific uh, plant. We also have a site in San Diego that also does peptides and Ambrunat for generics. So how can we help and what, what do we do? What do we do in terms of, of peptides and oligonucleotides in terms of innovation, for instance? So innovation is, is of utmost importance for us, but also for our customers and partners. So we're having different approaches toward green chemistry, for instance. And four different ways of seeing that in terms of solvent consumptions and usage. We can first look at reducing, and, and we've implemented that into our manufacturing facilities across the globe. And by reducing, it, we mean new practices. Percolation, we call that percolation to, you know, instead of batch to batch um, cleaning of resins, we use percolation. And that uses, and that allows us to save about 70% of solvents when we perform manufacturing. That's quite a lot when you use tons of DMF, for instance. We also are looking at recycling where we have in Belgium, for instance, a dedicated recycling plant, recycling all acetonitrile. So we're implementing and we have implemented those steps already. As you might be aware, quite a lot of actors in the peptide fields are looking at green solvents and we're taking those steps as well and working all together towards replacing nasty solvents with greener alternatives. And even funnier, we're even looking at no solvents at all. It works. You can take reagent A, reagent B, mix them together, no solvents, and in some conditions, it reacts. And so we're looking at that. It's called mechanochemistry, and it's a very exciting field. So in terms of innovation, we're not only looking at the chemistry itself. We're looking as well as at automation, engineering, uh, new uh, in silico tools or softwares that we design that will help the manufacturing and prediction of uh, the chemistry. We're looking at new technologies still in, in terms of process, in terms of industry, such as flow chemistry, new isolation techniques, but also electrochemistry. And we're looking at analytics. So for instance, we're looking a lot of details about uh, particle analysis at the moment. So all of that is covered by our global innovation team that has presence across the globe. But we're not doing that on our own. We, we have actors and partners that are helping us support all of that. 
So it's universities in Strasbourg, for instance, research groups, but also companies and biotechs around Europe and the globe that are supporting us in that regard. So in terms of ESG, ESG is a topic that is also popping up and is very important for us and our partners. So we've, we've done a materiality assessment uh, a, few, a few years back to see exactly where we did stand for. And we've identified 12 ESG topics that we have to and we will be working on. So for instance, sustainability, we just discussed that. Green chemistry, waste management, climate change protection, we're looking into that, we, we have taken actions into that. But also in terms of employees, where it's very important for us to you know, be doing people development, uh, the, the employee health is very important for us, but also diversity and inclusion. In terms of business, we have also taken some ESG topics and, and actions in terms of supply chain, product quality, but also business ethics and compliance. So what we are looking at this year and the years ahead is continuing our focus on green chemistry. And my colleague Jon will be presenting this afternoon some topics on that. And I'm sure at every single peptide conference you will see our colleagues from across the globe presenting green chemistry. So stay tuned, we're publishing quite a lot in that field. But also, of course, peptide development, people development and supply chain engagement. So we've, for instance, realized in the recent months CO2 assessments on all the sites. All right, so how can we tap from more peptide heritage in terms of quality to support oligonucleotide programs? As you can imagine, we have already an established quality management system, QMS, that follows ICH guidelines, GMP, and is FDA, um, of course, uh, following FDA guidelines. So, so we, we do have a broad quality manual that is uh, uh, defining those guidelines and the expectations in terms of uh, polypeptide as a group. So this quality manual is, of course, then divided into global policies, where those policies would typically cover um, the expectation in terms of business ethics, in terms of uh, manufacturing, and plenty of others. And those are then divided into SOPs, standard operating procedures. They are more details and cover something like analytical validation, process validation, but also the equipments. And then, as you can imagine, we also have a lot of supporting documents that are more batch records, procedures for manufacturing, cleaning, and others. So our quality management system is actually divided into a bunch of stuff. And those stuff are uh, subsystems. So those subsystems do cover, for instance, development. In terms of development, we're talking about Six Sigma, uh, black belt, uh, quality by design, analytical development. We then have a subsystem for the materials where we would be looking at supplier qualification, raw material handling, and distribution practices. We have a subsystem for production and, and monitoring that would be more process validation. We have, of course, a management subsystem that is more people-oriented. We're looking at training, quality training. A CAPA subsystem, so corrective action and preventive action. About complaints, about deviations. We have a change management system. And, of course, a facility system that is more uh, covering um, maintenance, preventive maintenance and such uh, topics. So how did we translate from peptide to oligonucleotide? Uh, as you can imagine, we, we have a quality management system that is covering APIs. So we can use that part to cover any kind of molecule, really. So we've, we could keep that one untouched. Some of those documents we had to adapt when they had to cover oligonucleotides. So global policies, facilities, utilities, cleaning, all, all of them had to be updated. And then we've had to create quite a bunch of specific documents, as you can imagine, so specification documents, procedures, and others. And so we've taken those steps and we've implemented that uh, to support oligonucleotide manufacturing. So as I just mentioned, uh, as, as, you, as you know, polypeptide does have a quality system, QMS, that is following ICH guideline and is uh, FDA compliant. So the QMS system that we have covers already the testing release 
and manufacturing of APIs, whether they are peptides, oligos, or other similar molecules like conjugates, where we've been doing plenty. And we've created quite a lot of new equipment, validation, supplier material, documentation to support that. So we could really tap on the existing quality document and quality knowledge to support our new programs. So how does that translate into regulatory requirements? So we're in a good position in the sense that all the sites we have have commercial experience. So we have commercial APIs on all the sites at Polypeptide. They are all GMP certified, of course, and all inspected by the US FDA. The local uh, authorities have been inspected all the sites, and also Japanese authorities, quite a few of them. And so we could really tap on that commercialization, knowledge, and experience and apply that to, to oligonucleotides, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. So to go back on ESG, we have applied for uh, ECOVADI certification on all the sites. And we could obtain the silver certification in Europe on all the sites. Also in Torrance, when we manufacture the oligos, the gold one in San Diego and the bronze one in Ambernath. So we're very happy to, to tap into all of that and apply that to those new programs. And so that will be the, the last one I have here, you know, to, to summarize exactly what we've discussed. We, we've been hearing from, from our partners, from our uh, customers, from our competitors, that the demand far outpaced the capacity in terms of oligos. So we've taken two steps. We've taken two steps to expand and support those programs and uh, be able to manufacture oligonucleotides. In terms of expertise, we, we've been doing key hires in the oligonucleotide space. And by partnering up with our existing chemists, we now have a dedicated team to support those programs. In terms of synergy, we do see that we can leverage the, the peptide heritage and experience and the quality system we have to ensure the high quality manufacturing standards of oligos. Innovation, we're striving for it, as we mentioned, and we're taking steps into ESG, into um, green approaches, reducing our footprint globally. Commercialization, the Polypeptide Group has been part of about 30 commercial projects. So we're manufacturing around 30 commercial APIs, and we're happy to use that experience into oligonucleotides and also generics. We do have quite a vast experience in, in manufacturing generics and are working quite close with the FDA. And we will be leveraging these for oligonucleotides. So I'm sorry I couldn't present some chemistry here today because all the exciting stuff we've been doing is covered by CDA and stuff. So um, hopefully on the next round, we'll be able to go into more details and share some exciting stuff with you. Thank you. Happy to take any question you have.